So to be cleansed from the red heifer, you would be you would bathe yourself on the third and seventh day, and you'll be sprinkled with the ashes of the red heifer. But we can't do that today because we don't have a sacrificial uh, priesthood doing it right now. Uh, because the last place we can only do it where Yahweh puts his name, and the last place he put his name was in the altar in Jerusalem. So, I'm going to show you at the end of this how we can honor that commandment and still keep that today. Okay? Alright, so, anyway. Uh, this Torah portion, this whole study, is about these Edomites. Uh, the, the Edomites are the descendants of Esau, and Edom means red, and then it's about this red heifer, and red is the color of sin, so this whole uh, poor fortune is about getting rid of sin, basically, and uh, also, the name of this title of this study is Decree Beyond Understanding, Hukat, Hukat in Hebrew, which means decrees beyond understanding, so this red heifer is a mystery to the most Jewish people. They have no idea what it means. It's decree beyond their understanding. But I think I have an idea of what it means. And I'm going to try to explain that today. And I hope um, that you find it interesting. So, this red heifer sacrifice was done outside the camp because defilement of death was really bad. If you were defiled of death, that's a bad thing. And we're not supposed to touch a dead body, go in the same room as a dead body. We're just not supposed to do that. It's super important. Now, blasphemers. There were certain things that were done outside the camp on the second offer. Blasphemers were done, uh, were, uh, had to do uh, sacrifices outside the camp. Because blasphemy is bad. That's when you're using God's name in a bad way. And raging, uh, ma making a rule and saying Yahweh said to do that. Or... You know, doing a sin and saying Yahweh said to do that, or any in any way that you're using God's name in a bad way, that would be blasphemy. Okay, the uh, Yom Kippur was done on this altar outside the camp. Also, um, the uh, ordinations of the priest was done outside the camp. They had to be cleansed and purified first outside the camp, and then they were brought inside. Uh, the tabernacle. And then also sin offerings of the priests. Now, priests were not supposed to sin. They were supposed to be at a higher level of uh, holiness to be, you know, priests in, priests in those days. It's very important that they were an example. And I take that as us. If you're an elder or a deacon or you've been in the church a long time or you're a pastor or a preacher, well, then you also have a high responsibility to lead by example by keeping the commandments uh, very diligently. Now, if a, pray, uh, if a priest sinned, it would be embarrassing. They'd have to do a sacrifice outside the camp so everybody knew. And then also, they'd have to do it with a bull. And the bull was like $3,000, today's money. A sheep is only like $250. So... Uh, when a priest sins, it's expensive. It's the price of a car. So we are not to sin. If, you know, we have we all have a higher calling to be that. It says in Revelation, we are priests and kings. So we need we're like priests in training. So we want to we want to act like a priest. Our our righteousness needs to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, which would be a pastor at your church or uh, uh, somebody in the Orthodox um, synagogue. We need to be more righteous than they are. Okay. That's what Yahweh is telling us to do. So we need to step up our game. We need to push push it to the next level as far as trying to be holy. We want to be pure and holy and righteous. Okay, so this altar was done on the Mount of Olives. Okay, this is the same place where Yeshua was sacrificed. Now I'm going to show you through this red heifer sacrifice how it points to the Messiah. This red heifer sacrifice. So, it was done on the Mount of Olives. Just like Yeshua. And also, there was three items that were used. There was the red heifer, there was the cedar wood, and the hyssop. Well, what is the red heifer? Well, Yeshua wore, he wore a red robe. He wore a red robe. He also... Uh, they used hyssop. They tried to make him drink vinegar. 
uh, with this hyssop, a big refused. And then they also nailed him, which I believe was a cedar wood stake. So they need him nailed him. So the same items that are used for the red hatcher are used in this sacrifice of the Messiah as well. I don't think it's a coincidence, you guys. It gets even better. Listen to this. So just as the red heifer is tied to a stake and put on the altar, so is the shield tied to the same stake. Not only is it done in the Mount of Olives outside the East Gate, so is Yeshua tied on the Mount of Olives outside the East Gate. Um, this, okay, now when the red heifer was burnt up, they would take the ashes of the red heifer and they would put it in a clean vessel outside the camp. Now Yeshua was, when he died, he was put in a clean vessel outside the camp. Okay? It's not a coincidence, you guys. It gets even better. Now, the red heifer has to be four years old. Well, Yeshua's ministry was three and a half years. Okay, so there's a whole lot of similarity here. Okay? Before he was cut off. The red heifer was purchased by the priest. Yeshua was purchased by the priest. They paid Judas 30 shekels of silver. So you see the similarities? And then, now here's the kicker. Ready? When the priest would do the sacrifice of the red heifer, they would become physically unclean. It's the only sacrifice where they would become unclean. When the Pharisees sold Yeshua to, to, to his death, this and Yeshua willingly sacrificed himself for us, took our, took our punishment for us. This made the Pharisees spiritually unclean, very unclean. They, the sin was so grievous, they become unclean. So all of this whole red heifer is the Messiah. And the red heifer allows you to be cleansed from death. But what did Yeshua do? He cleansed us from eternal death. We no longer are going to die. So this is beautiful. So as the red heifer cleanses us physically of death, so does Yeshua cleanse us spiritually of death. i got to write that down. Hold on a minute. Okay, thanks so much for uh, listening. So yes, so let me read that. Let me say that again. The red heifer cleanses uh, us physically of death. Right? If we're supposed to. But the Yeshua cleanses us spiritually of death. So we no longer are going to die. We have eternal life. Now he reversed what Adam did. Adam sinned and closed the heavenly tabernacle. He sinned in the very presence of Yahweh. And Yahweh had to kick him out of the Garden of Eden. This was his throne area on earth. And so he defiled the heavenly tabernacle and separated man from, um, from Yahweh. And Yeshua reversed that. So this red heifer sacrifice is amazing because the red heifer sacrifice, they would take the blood of the red heifer and they would throw it on the, thre the threshold doorway of the tabernacle and it would cleanse the doorway of the tabernacle. Well, with Yeshua's blood, when he died, he cleansed the heavenly tabernacle, opening up the doorway back to the Father. He is the door and the way back to the Father. This is amazing, you guys. Think about this. Sorry, I dropped the paper there. Okay, so... So he is the door and the way back to the Father. This is amazing. So uh, so the the Adam, what Adam did was uh, he shut the doorway and Yeshua opened the doorway. He opened the doorway. He is the door and the way back to the Father. So this is amazing. And so now we have a way back to the Father because of this red heifer sacrifice. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this a little bit more at the end, but um, first I want to talk about some other things in this Torah portion.
So, um, what I was going to point out was, Yah cannot, he's a spiritual being, and we are in the flesh and subject to aging and dying. And so, Yah cannot be around death. And so, um, as we grow in the Holy Spirit, when we get baptized and receive the seed of the Holy Spirit, the more holy things we do, the more Holy Spirit we get, the more we become like Yahweh, who is all spirit. So this is our whole job. And because of this great love that Yeshua had for Yahweh by keeping this commandment of the Red Heifer, um, he reversed what Adam did. You can reverse what Adam did. This is beautiful. Okay. So let's talk about um, who who had... The, I'm going to talk about more about this numbers right here. Who had the first mega church in Scripture? Who had the first mega church? And um, Moses. Moses had 1.8 million people. 1.8 million people. That is a mega church. <laughs> Okay, that is huge. Okay, so um, he, had, he had to hire, he had to get not hire, but he had to uh, anoint 70 elders to help him. And they anointed them with the Holy Spirit so they could help them handle all these people. Because one man cannot handle it himself. I don't know, he had the hardest job in all of scripture, I'm telling you, man. He had to deal with, um, he had to deal with uh, 1.8 million hungry, thirsty, sweaty, stinky, uh, grumpy, tired, just stubborn, pagan, kind of, a little bit. So, I mean, so he, he, uh, he did a great job. He really did. He did a fantastic job. He was the most humble man on earth. And this is why Yahweh used him. And, uh, so, so, um, so my question is, um, why did he strike the rock the first time, and then the second time he was supposed to speak to the rock, but he struck it? Well, um, it kind of points to the Messiah, right? The Messiah was um, struck the first time, and out of his belly came the waters, living waters, blood and water. And uh, it says in scripture, let's read this right here. John 7, 13. Yeshua stood up and called out with a loud voice. If anyone is thirsty, let him come in me to drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, streams of living water will flow from within them. So we'll never thirst again from this living water. It's really pointing to the Holy Spirit. So this whole Torah portion is about the Spirit and growing in the Spirit and in opening up the spiritual doorway back to the Father, and He did that for because of this great love. Love is what opened the door, and uh, because He loved Yahweh so much, He kept the commandments and never sinned. He was tempted just like everybody else, but He never sinned. And so this is showing great love, and He showed great love to us because He actually took our punishment. He took our punishment. Okay, so it says in Scripture. There's no better thing you can do than to give up your life for another. And that's exactly what he did. He gave up his life, died a horrible death for us. So that's great love. He showed great love to the Father and great love to us. And this is what opened up that door and made him the rest of sacrifice. It was love. And the whole point of this is love is the most powerful force in the universe. It is more powerful than any evil. It will outdo anything. Love is the strongest, most powerful thing that you can you can attain. It's the highest form of intelligence. Love is it, you guys. This is love. Love, it lasts forever. There's three things that last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And love is the greatest. Yahweh lasts forever because he's all love. Think about it. He's love and light. So we need to learn how to love, be loving and light like Yeshua. Willing to sacrifice ourselves for others. And willing to sacrifice our time, talents, and energy advancing God's kingdom. Bringing more people to the kingdom. And also to um, to keep the commandments because that shows Yahweh you love Him. So love beats all. It totally destroyed the king of evil's plan. Satan's plan was to kill the Messiah. And... He, he got to kill the Messiah, but it totally backfired on him. Because it was so evil and wicked, and Yeshua had so much love, it just backfired on him. 
And so it, it, it's, this is amazing. This is amazing. A picture of how love conquers everything. When we use love, we win every single time. We win every single time. You might think you lost, but in the long run, you will really win every time you use love. Okay, let's talk about this. Um, so they're in the desert, Moses and the Israelites, and they're complaining about these um, not having food and water and all that stuff. And so, so because they're complaining, um, Yahweh sends snakes to bite them. He sends these snakes to bite them. And uh, their people are dying, and Moses is, is so concerned. He's so ca he cares so much about the people, and he's like the leader. He's so good, and he's praying to Yahweh, please stop this. And so he says, build a bronze snake and put it on a, put it put it up on a pole, and, uh, and when they look upon that snake, they'll be healed. So that's the weirdest thing in scripture, right? It's one of the weirdest things in scripture. I mean, what does it point to? Well. It points to the way they were acting. They were acting like wicked serpent snakes. And who's this serpent snake? And Satan. Satan is evil. He is. Uh, all, he's the king of evil. He's the ki he's the god of this world. It says. And so they were acting like the god of this world, Satan. And so when they realized this, what the, the way they were acting by looking upon this serpent, Satan, they repented, and they stops, and then so they were healed. And it says in scripture, when you look upon Yeshua, you will be healed. So Yeshua was hung on that cross as well. He was hung on a cross. But he's not a snake. So what does it point to? Well, it points to what really happened on that cross. Okay? Yeshua died on that cross, but really what happened was he actually put to death Satan on that cross. That day, because the evil plan that that Satan had to kill the Messiah totally backfired and reversed back onto him, and he was the one who died that day. He actually died, and um, so he on that on this bronze serpent is a picture of the of Satan dying that day. This was the day because Satan is the king of this world, the god of this world. He usurped Adam's authority and um, became the king of this world. Adam was supposed to be the king, but he didn't. He sinned and failed. Yeshua came, and now he's the king. And he, when he died and he gave up his life, this great love, and he never sinned ever. He passed the test, the ultimate test, and became king of this earth. And so Satan actually died that day on that cross. Not Yeshua. Yeshua was raised three days later and he lives forever now. Satan is going to be destroyed. So Satan died on that cross. So Satan's biggest victory was his biggest defeat that day. He, he killed himself. Because he was so, he's the king of evil. And Yeshua was all love. He loved his father so much he kept all the commandments. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And he... Gave up his life for another. There's no better thing you can do. And he, so he loved others. And so this great love that he did defeated the evil plan and evil king, Satan. So Satan's plan fully backfired. And he lost that day. He lost that day. So it got totally reversed. And the biggest, the funniest part about the whole thing, it's not really funny, but the most ironic part about the whole thing was... That Satan had no idea that this was the red heifer sacrifice that he was having him killed on. He didn't realize it. And so he not only did he kill himself, but, and Yeshua become the king, but he actually set it up for us to be cleansed and of the defilement of death spiritually. So we're not going to die anymore. He cleansed us spiritually. So Satan's plan actually was a great blessing to us. His evil plan backfired so badly that he's the one that died on that cross because Yeshua was the king. Yeshua was going to order him dead. He's going to be destroyed, it says in the scriptures. Yeshua was the king, and he's going to order that. 
uh, Satan is no longer have authority anymore. Once you become a Christian, Yeshua is your king and Yahweh. And so, uh, he will be destroyed. Satan will be destroyed. So he actually killed himself and he, in disguise, it was the red heifer sacrifice. So when he did that sacrifice of him, he didn't know that every human that ever lived is going to have the ability to live forever. We are cleansed of the defilement of death spiritually because of Yeshua being the red heifer. This is amazing, you guys. Think about this. I'm going to say it one more time because it's so amazing, okay? i got to say it one more time. <laughs> okay, so this death on the cross, the Satan plan to kill Yeshua, backfired on him because of the great love that Yeshua had. He never sinned, right? And just like Adam was never supposed to sin and he was going to be king, okay, so did Yeshua. And he also loved his neighbor because he died for us. This great love made him be the king of this earth. And now Satan can't be king because Yeshua is king and he's going to order Satan to be killed. So he usurped, he took back the throne. And he's going to order Satan to be killed. Okay? So this, his, his biggest victory was his biggest defeat. And it points to this bronze snake dying on the cross. So Satan didn't die, or Yeshua didn't die. Satan died on that day on the cross. He's a serpent. He, he, and Yeshua atoned for us. He atoned for us. So also the other thing that it points to is the red heifer sacrifice. This sacrifice was a hidden red heifer sacrifice, which cleansed us not just physically of death, but spiritually, you guys. He cleansed us spiritually of death. We are no longer. He cleansed the heavenly tabernacle, as it says in Hebrews 9 and 10. That Yeshua cleansed the heavenly tabernacle. And this red heifer sacrifice, he, he, the blood, his blood cleanses the threshold door. And Yeshua is the door and the way back to the Father. So nobody can get to the, the Father only through Yeshua. And so it's this red heifer sacrifice that cleanses the doorway back to the Father and cleanses us of the defilement of death. And so no longer, everyone here has probably broken the Sabbath on Saturday and deserves to be stoned, but Yeshua took that away and cleanses of that spiritual death. So we do not receive the, the, cur the sin the sins that lead to death, and we no longer have the curse of death on us. So it's beautiful. It's beautiful. He's the red heifer sacrifice, and he also is uh, killed Satan um, with this bronze serpent thing symbolically. How awesome is that? Wow. That is amazing. That is <laughs> simply amazing. This proportion is fantastic. It's fantastic. Okay. Um... So, I'm going to talk about one more part of this portion, and that's Jephthah. And uh, in, in Judges 11, oh, before I talk about that, I want to talk about Mordecai and Haman. Haman wanted to kill Mordecai, right? And so he built this wooden stake, and he was going to hang Mordecai on this stake and all the Jews, right? And this was Satan's plan. This was a picture of Satan. And what happened? Uh, Esther saves the day, right? And everybody's fasting. And uh, guess who gets hung on that uh, on that uh, stake? But Haman. Haman got hung. He is a picture of Satan. So, so uh, again, we see that his his evil plan backfired, just like with, with, uh, with Yeshua. Praise Yah. And what that points to is love wins, you guys. Love wins every battle. Even if we die as martyrs, if you have love for the people that are killing you, you won. You won. You made it to the kingdom. If you can pray for those who are killing you, you are, you've arrived as a, as a Christian. That's what Yeshua did. Okay. Now, let's talk about Jephthah. Uh, Judges 11, Jephthah was betrayed by his own brothers, just like Yeshua. He was forced out of his homeland, just like Yeshua. He was actually forced out of, he was forced out of uh, his homeland for 2,000 years. Um, 
sadly. Uh, also, uh, he was forced out of his inheritance. He, he was supposed to be a king, and so was Yeshua. Uh, but he did become the leader after all, because they went to him, they cried out for his help, just like we're going to cry out for his help when uh, he comes back. He was considered um, a rejected son, a bastard son, I guess you could say. I don't even like to use that word, but um, but he comes back and he saves his brothers, just like the Messiah is going to save his brothers. Now, when he comes back, he had to offer up. Uh, he said, "Whatever comes out first, I'm going to offer up as a sacrifice." And his virgin daughter came out. And so many people think that he offered up his daughter. And that is, that is not correct. If you read the scriptures, it clearly says that she was a virgin and she, she cried because of her virginity. So she had to stay. She was consecrated to Yahweh, giving her whole life to Yahweh and not marrying. So she wasn't able to, back then, not having a child was a big deal. She was completely devoted to Yahweh and could not marry a man. So she was dedicated to him. And it says that in verse 11, it says she married no man. So there is, Yahweh does not allow for human sacrifice. That is illegal. I mean, Yeshua was not a sacrifice, you guys. He willingly sacrificed himself, okay? There's a difference. It's kind of like jumping on a hand grenade to save your buddies. That's what he did. Uh, we all deserved an electric chair. And, and to, to broken the Sabbath and then, you know, sins. But Yeshua took that for us. That's how much He loves us. So, how amazing is that? And it even says she wept for her virginities because she was going to be a virgin for, for her whole life. But what better inheritance is it to have Yahweh as your inheritance? If you dedicate your life to Yahweh, that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. Um, so, yes, this third portion is a beautiful picture. Um, and what's it all point to? Well, it points to us. We are supposed to be priests and kings. We need to push ourselves to be a, at a higher level. To be holy and Kodesh, set apart to Yahweh. Um, to, to be an example, to be an example in our family, to be an example in our church, to be an example in our community. And it also points to um, this Torah portion points to the beautiful picture of how love always wins. Love always wins. Love will always, it's the most powerful force in the universe. And we can conquer anything with love. You can stop the wars. You can stop uh, lawsuits. You can stop arguments. You can stop everything with love. The soft, gentle, kind, loving voice. You can accomplish miracles and big things in your life. And so always learn to grow in this love. And we can only do it with the Holy Spirit. Okay, the Spirit is love. And so how do we fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit? Well, we instead of watching YouTube, we watch sermons. And, and instead of watching TV, we, and listening to worldly music, we listen to worship music. And going out and helping the widows, the orphans, the poor, the sick, the imprisoned, the foreigners. Okay? Going out and spreading the gospel. Going out and um, fasting all day. 12 hours without food and water or without food at least and uh, doing it to become closer to Yahweh uh, reading your Bible every day can you read at least 10 minutes a day if you read 10 minutes a day you go through the whole Bible one year praying twice a day as we're commanded we're commanded to read the Bible every day Joshua 1.8 commands it comes with a great blessing you'll be prosperous and successful not just financially but spiritually most likely and then it refers to and then also, uh, 2 Corinthians 2.4 commands us to uh, pray. and It's an appointed time with Yahweh. So I usually pray that day or sing to Him. Or, uh, and also in Numbers 28, it's a Lord's evening. It's Lord's evening. We, are called to be pre we are called to be priests and kings. So 
Let's bring it to a higher level, you guys. Let's become devout, all in, 100% dedicated to Yahweh. Let's let's step up our game. Let's go from lukewarm. Yahweh is going to spit out the lukewarm. He wants us to become all in, fully dedicated, uh, committed to Yahweh's kingdom work and kingdom things. Let's step up our game, you guys. Let's 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 make it to the kingdom. Let's be the saints we're called to be. Ephesians 1 1 says we are saints. All right, I'm just going to finish with this, and then uh, we will be done. Father, we come to seek your face today. We come to meet with you. Our soul cries out to you. Our flesh cries out to you. We want to know you. We want to encounter you in a deeper way. We lift up our praise to you. We lift up our worship to you. We hunger and thirst for you. I pray lives will be transformed in this city. I pray anointings will happen. I pray Yah's Holy Spirit will fall upon you mightily today. Let there be an awakening in this town. Let there be a revival in this town. Pour out your Holy Spirit mightily upon this desert land. Acts 1 8, you have to spread, to, you want to spread the gospel. This is not optional, this is a command. You have a mission, Matthew 28. You have gifts to use for the church. You have a purpose. You are safe in Messiah. Nothing can separate you from his love. You have been delivered from temptations, 1 Corinthians 10. Your spirit lives in you. You are a citizen of Yah's assembly. You are set apart from the world. You have been given the power to overcome evil. You are the dwelling place of Yah's spirit. You are a new being in Messiah. You are a saint established by Yahweh. You are joint heirs with Messiah. You are free from condemnation. You belong to Yah's family. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are precious and loved by Yahweh. Nothing can separate you from his love. You are beloved Kedoshim, a holy one, a son and daughter of the Almighty. You are called, chosen and anointed, set apart. For death say to the Most High, do not neglect his calling. Do not let anyone take your five crowns. Thank you so much for listening to me. I pray this inspires you to become devout, all in, 100% dedicated to Yahweh. Step up your game, you guys, because when the Messiah comes, judgment time will be here. We want to be one of the ten virgins that have their oil lamp filled with the Holy Spirit. So we can be in the marriage supper of the Lamb, you guys. So let's do this. Let's Yeshua open the door for us. Let's walk through that door, okay? All right, thank you so much for listening. May God bless all of you mightily today. We give you a miracle that you've been waiting for all year. Thank you.